Malongas Glalabung, that's good afternoon in my language. First, I would like to thank the College of Languages, Linguistics, and Literature for choosing me as one of the, of the two recipients of the Excellence in Doctoral Dissertation Research Award for this year. It's a great honor. My name is Sharon Joy Bulalam. I'm a native Subanon and an international student from the Philippines. My dissertation is a description of the grammar of Subanon. For my talk today, I'm going to discuss the salient features of Subanon grammar. So like slideshow. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to give some background information about this language. Then I'm going to discuss the research methodology. Following that, I'm going to discuss the open word classes and the closed word classes. Then I'm going to present the salient morphosyntactic properties of this language. And I will end my presentation with a summary, conclusion, and acknowledgments. Subanon background information. Subanon is known in the literature as Western Subanon and as Shokon Subanon. Subanon refers to the people, and the term Sinubanon refers to the language. However, at present, the word Subanon is used for both the people and the language. Genetic classification. Subanon is a member of a subgroup of languages called Subanon that belongs to the Greater Central Philippine branch of the Malayo-Polynesian or Sunnesian language family. According to Ethnologue, it has about 125,000 speakers found in the six major areas on the Zamboanga Peninsula, Malaya Lintangan, where I come from, Shokon, Baligian, Ipil, and Artilim. The language has three aerial dialects, Molayal Sinubanon, Shokon Sinubanon and Butalak Dikolam Sinubanon. And I speak the Mulayal Sinubanon. There are two maps on this um, slide. On the left is the Philippine map highlighting the location of Zamboanga Peninsula. And within Zamboanga Peninsula, we can find the, where the uh, areas, the three dialects of Subanon where it is spoken, where they are spoken. One is in Malayal, my home place. What, another is in Shokon, the other one is in Butalak de Colom. Social linguistic situation. The Subanons are multilingual. They can also speak the majority languages of the region, such as Cebuano and Chavacano, and some can speak Tausum. Economy. Traditionally, they are primarily farmers and secondarily fishermen. Currently, they engage in small scale in small scale buy and sell businesses. The picture that I'm showing is, the, is a recent picture of the Subanans living in Gimbaparang, an interior mountain, of area, an mountain area of Malayal, harvesting the wild tuber known as kolut, which requires processing to be edible as a substitute for rice during the community quarantines at this time of the COVID-19 COVID global pandemic. Education. There are existing preschools, elementary and high schools in the Subanan communities, but for vocational college and university levels, they go to Zamboanga City or to the other areas in the Philippines. Vitality, the language is highly endangered despite ethnologues claim that it is a developing language. Two major reasons for its endangerment are, are one, only adult Subanan can speak the language fluently. Two, it is only in the Malaya Lintangan area where adult fluent speakers and children are speaking it in widely, it widely in all domain. Alphabet, the Subanan, Subanan has 15 consonants and five vowels. And the Subanan writing system was officially standardized only in January 2019 by people of the community, the Subanan Grade School teachers, the Department of Education, Region 9, the Indigenous Peoples Organization in Mindanao, and SIL Philippines. Funding. This dissertation is funded by the National Science Foundation Doctoral Dissertation. 
Research Improvement Grant and by the East West Center Travel Research Grant and the Belinda A. Aquino Philippine Studies Award. Research Methodology. Even if I am a native speaker of this language, I did not rely exclusively on my knowledge of the language. I had to collect data. So I did field work beginning in 2016, summer of 2016, summer of 2017, summer of 2018, and summer of 2019 in Zamboanga. The types of data that I collected are the following. So there are interviews, natural conversation, demonstration of how recordings of demonstrations of how a particular food dish is prepared and recordings of the descriptions of some very traditional practices such as planting, harvesting, fishing, weddings, and burial. Part of my dissertation process is archiving the Subanum digital data. So all data collected for this research, including recordings, transcriptions, and annotation files are accessible via the Kaipoleohane Digital Ethnographic Archive at the University of Hawaii. So those are some background information about my language. I'm now going to discuss the open word classes of Subanon. Just like the other languages in the world, Subanon has verbs, nouns, adjectives, and adjectival verbs. I'm going to discuss each of these. Verbs. As we know, verbs express states, actions, events, and processes. They are indicated by varied affixes that simultaneously encode time, voice, and so on. Verbs are divided into two general classes based on the way the affixes they take and code time as mood-based and aspect-based. What is the mood system? So the mood-based verbal affixes encode time as realis and irrealis. Realist mood is a term for events that have happened, such as past and present ongoing events, whereas irrealist mood is a term for events that have not yet happened, such as future, hypothetical, and potential events. What are, um, what is the mood, what is the aspect system? So the aspectual system expresses time by viewing events as a whole and they are regarded as either perfective or non-perfective. The perfective aspect is used for events that are completed or done, while the non-perfective is for non-completed events. These are the mood-based verbal affix affixes. Notice that they are divided into realis and irrealis, and each of them have functions, and each of them has a focused argument. And these are the aspect-based verbal affixes, they are split between perfective and non-perfective with their different functions and a focused argument. So with either, with either temporality marking, the relevant affixes also express voice which highlights the focus argument, argument in a clause. Some roots in the language can take either the mood base or the aspectual affixes. An example of that is the verb bogoy, which means give. Give can take the mood affixes and the aspectual affixes. So I'm not going through all the examples in this, I mean, the different uh, forms of this verb, taking the mood affixes and the aspectual affixes. But what I want you to see here is that the verb bogoy can take the different realis and irrealis form using the mood-based affixes and the perfective and non-perfective as aspectual affixes. Nouns. Nouns are labels for human, animate, and inanimate entities. They are grouped into common nouns and proper nouns requiring different sets of case markers. So in the language, there are different sets of case markers for common nouns and proper nouns, such as human beings. So names of human beings and roots that we that begin with a vowel, a glide, and the alveolar lateral approximant are articulated with G initial. In other words, there's always G before you pronounce those roots. And roots that begin with the, uh, the following consonants like P, B, T, D, G, K, M, N, N, G, S, and H are not pronounced with G initial. The G initial in roots that begin with a vowel, glide, and alveolar lateral approximants are presented, are given here. So these are examples of roots that have G initials, that are pronounced with G initials. And historically, they are from, the G there came from the 
final G of the case markers of Nog and Sog. There is a historical explanation for this. Roots beginning with other consonants do not, are not pronounced with the G initial. So they are, I gave some examples in this slide. We're done discussing about adjective, uh, verbs and nouns in the language. Let's look at adjectives. Adjectives describe property concepts and do not encode mood or aspect marking. Their function is to modify nouns and verbs. They are generally indicated by the affixes mo and by other type of affixes shown in the next slide. It is important to note that the prefix mo, which is our basic adjective adjectival marker becomes om before a bilabial stop p or b. These are the adjectival affixes in the language and mo has a plural equivalent moko. Adjectives are subdivided into several types. So in table seven, I specify the different types of adjectives in the language. As you can see there, all the adjectives start with the affix mo, the prefix mo, which metastasizes to um, om if the root is, uh, if the root begins with letter P or B, just like the color term om white, puti, if you want to use it as an adjective, you use om, however it becomes, uh, you use mo, but however, ever it, however it becomes om before a P or a B. Adjectival verbs. So we have verbs, we have nouns, we have adjectives. Now, what is what are adjectival verbs? Adjectival verbs are words that express property concepts. However, unlike adjectives, adjectival verbs can express mood or aspect distinctions. They are like verbs because they express mood or aspect. In other words, they express time. They are like adjectives that modify nouns as shown in their ability to occur with, sorry about that, to occur with intensifiers and temporality marking. Almost all adjectives can be converted into adjectival verbs. And adjectival verbs are primarily indicated by the mimo affixes. The adjectival verb affixes express incoactivity or becoming X. These are the adjectival verb affixes. Notice that because they are like verbs, they are like adjectives, I, um, split them between mood-based. They can be split between um, mood-based and aspect-based. So there are, these are the particular affixes that indicate adjectival verb in mood-based, expressing mood and aspect. And like verbs, they also have a focused argument. These are the examples of adjectival verbs in the language. So the same to subclassify them, I use the same um, classifications as the as the classifications that I did for um, adjectives. So, um, as you notice here, there are like, for example, in the dimension adjectival verb type, there's an example there. Became big, you use misolag, but when you say to become big, you you use mosolag. Okay, so having discussed the different types of open word classes in my language, I would like to give a summary of the distributional properties of open word classes. So nouns can occur with case markers, but not with temporality and degree marking. It can also, verbs on the other hand can occur with temporality marking, but not degree marking. Adjectival verbs can occur with degree marking and temporality marking. Adjectives can occur with degree marking but not temporality marking. You will be surprised while I'm mentioning degree marking when I did not give examples of each of them, but um, about them, but I have thoroughly discussed this in my dissertation. Let's look at the closed word categories and their examples. So I'm not going through each of these thoroughly. I am just going to enumerate the different closed word categories in my language. So there's lots of them. There's adverb, pronoun, relativizer, vocative, deictic determiner, numeral, quantifier, classifier, case marker, conjunction, discourse marker, adverbial, negator, interjection, interrogative, and preposition. So I gave an example for each of them.
those are the different closed word categories. Closed word categories means their membership is not as many as the open word categories. So open word categories um, have many or numerous memberships. Having discussed the different word, a different open word classes and closed word classes, I'm now going to discuss the salient morphosyntactic properties of this language, starting with symmetrical voice, followed by the number, agree by number agreement, and then the serial verb construction. What is symmetrical voice? Symmetrical voice is a system of alignment of transitive clauses, which show competing patterns, the agent voice highlighting the agent argument, the patient voice giving prominence to the patient argument, and the goal voice underscoring the goal argument. Symmetrical voice has two important features according to the literature. One, neither of the voice is more basic than the others, and all of their, and all have their own, sorry, have their own distinctive morpheme on the verb, and none of the arguments become oblique in either voice pattern. So let us look at the English voice system and how it is different from the symmetrical voice in the next slide. So English voice system, the English voice system differentiates active voice from passive voice. Let's look at an active construction here on the left. The man made a canoe. In this active sentence, the subject is the man and the direct object is the canoe. Note that the verb made is not marked and there is no oblique argument because the subject man is marked by the case marker the and the direct object canoe is marked by a. The active voice is the normal way of saying something in English. Thus, it is more basic than the passive voice. Now, let's look at the passive equivalent of the active construction there. This is, the, this is it. A canoe was made by the man. In this passive sentence, the subject is now the canoe. The direct object is man. And note that the subject and object roles have been reversed. They are switched. Also, the verb made is marked by was, as you see there. And um, the agent in the clause is converted into an oblique as shown by the presence of the, pre of the preposition by. Therefore, if you compare the active and the passive voice, the English voice system is asymmetrical or non-symmetrical. That's not the case of Subanon voice system because the Subanon voice system is symmetrical. It can focus on the agent, on the agent Using the agent voice pattern, it can focus on the patient using the, pa the patient voice pattern. It can focus on the goal, which, is, which can be a goal, location, beneficiary, recipient, and referential using the goal voice pattern. And none of the voice forms is more basic than the other. And the more prominent argument is co-indexed by a specific verbal affix, on the, verbal affix and the case marker of. The non-prominent arguments are marked by the case markers nom and som. In this dissertation, the more prominent argument is called the focused argument. These are the different voice affixes. I split them into mood-based and aspect-based, and each of them has agent voice focusing on the agent argument. It has a patient voice focusing on the patient or instrumental or instrument argument and a goal voice that can focus on a goal, location, beneficiary, recipient, and referential. These are some examples of symmetrical voice sentences in the mood system. In 3A, 3A is, an agent, is in the agent voice pattern. The verb bunag, which means for, takes a different affix, and um, the focus argument is marked by of. In this sentence, the agent is the highlighted argument. 3B, is in the patient voice pattern. Notice the verb for, bunag, is taking other types of affixes. And this time, to let you know that the patient is the focus of the sentence, the og, the case marker og is now with the patient to be. 3C is in the goal voice pattern. Bunag, for, takes different types of affixes, signifying that now the focus argument is location as marked by as co-indexed by the focus marker of. These are examples of symmetrical voice sentences in the aspectual system. For A is in the agent voice. 
feel. We're using the same verb, bunag. However, um, it takes a different type of affix um, resulting to some assimilation process. So, mm, so the B there is deleted. Um, that's what we call assimilation process. So, um, and the focus of the verb is the agent as co-indexed by the focus marker of, and for B is in the patient voice, the verb bunag is taking a different type of affix, focusing to show that it's now focusing on the patient as marked by the all case marker there, with uh, co-occurring with to big water. And in 4C, which is in the go voice, the verb for takes a different type of affix, indicating that it is now the location that is the focus of the verb. And og is indeed um, co-occurring with the locative argument. So we're done with symmetrical voice. Let's look at number agreement. Number agreement is a system of marking the number features of a noun on a verb, adjective, or an adjectival verb. In the interest of time, I will only show the verbal agreement. These are number agreement affixes in the language. So there are specific affixes indicating singularity and plurality that occur with active verbs, stative verbs, transitive verbs, adjectives, and adjectival verbs. So let's look at an example of verbal agreement here as indicated by G nasalization strategy. 5A, there's a single agent there. It's an intransitive verb with a single agent. Now the verb gobok run can only take one type of an um, agent voice marker, um to indicate a singular or a single agent. However, and it cannot take the other type of the agent voice marker mog as shown by 5B. To express a plural agent, the verb gobok has to take mog and nasalize the final G of that affix as we can see in 5C. And that mog, so that's what we call the G nasalization strategy for plural agent. And that mong cannot be used with a singular agent as we can see in 5D. Another way of indicating plurality on a verb is by using pom. So 6A is still an intransitive verb with the verb, it's, we're use, I'm using bobat here sing. However, if you see 6C, you cannot just use me and nasalize the G of that verb to G of that affix to indicate plural agent. It cannot be. That is not allowed in the language. What Subanon does is to take the affix POV to indicate plurality, which I analyze as distributive marker, um, indicating that each person is singing, is doing the singing. So that is what that is why we have the POG in 6A. So that's how we do um, plural marking on the verb. And um, that POG, the final G of that POG cannot be um, nasalized just to indicate plurality. And also, it's not in the example, the MIK POG BOBAT OGOTO singular agent cannot be used there. So MIK POG cannot be used with singular agent. It has to occur with, a plural, with plural agents. Let's look at agreement in symmetrical voice patterns. Agreement in symmetrical voice is triggered by the focused argument. 7A is in the agent voice pattern where um, the plural agent triggers nasalization of the final G of the affix MIG, but not the plural patient in 7B. Similarly, in the patient voice, only the plural patient can trigger plural marking on the verb, as we can see in 8A, but not a plural agent in 8B. Likewise, in the goal voice, only the plural goal can trigger number agreement on the verb, as evidenced by 9A, uh, the using the nasalization strategy, but not a plural agent on the um, yeah, I know. Thank you, Jim. But not the plural agent on the, in, as we can see in 9B. So serial verb constructions. 
Serial verb constructions are sentences consisting of more than one verb as in 10. So 10 is an example of SVC. There are two verbs juxtaposed each other or put side by side. Um, that's the, the equivalent of that sentence is that the, that person slept with an open mouth, but that's not a serial verb construction in English. In Subanan, it is. 11 um, is not an example of SVC because it has a conjunction between the two verbs. So these are the criteria of these are the properties of SVCs in the language. So they occur without conjunctions. They occur without complementizer. You can just read that. I mean, they, you can just see that. So there are 11 properties of SVCs. Among the 11 properties of SVCs, I want to highlight the following two properties. They have only one focus argument. They have one number agreement marker. So one focus argument. SVCs have only one focus argument. The verb in an SVC can be both AV, they can be both AV or agent voice, they can be both PV, or a combination of AV and PV, or GV and AV. I haven't seen all GV mark B1 and B2 in SVC in my language. Okay, um, thus B1 can be in the AV, PV, and GV, and the V2 can only be in the agent voice or patient voice pattern. It is the V1 that determines the focus argument. And what I'm saying here is summarized in, tab in table 14. One number agreement marker. So in SVCs, the number agreement is marked in V1. As you can see in 12A, V1 and V2 are bo both agent voice. The number agreement marker is on verb one, and there is only one focus argument, which is um, marked by OG. There are no, you cannot have two OG mark um, arguments in an SVC. Another is um, in 13A, V1 is PV, V2 is AV, the agreement marker, number agreement marker is on the on V1 and there is only one focus argument. Same thing with um, 13B, 13B, V1 is goal voice, V2 is agent voice, V1 contains the number agreement marker and there is only one focus argument here. Summary of two highlighted SVC features. The verb in an SVC can have uniform and non-uniform voice marking. It is always V1 that determines the focus argument and carries the number agreement marking. So to summarize my discussion, Subanen has four open word classes and it has 16 word classes. Among its striking features, symmetrical voice, number agreement, and serial verb constructions. In symmetrical voice, the agent, patient, and the goal can be the focus argument of the verb. In number agreement, there is verbal adjective and adjective verb agreement in the language. In the SVC, the V1 determines the focus argument and contains number, the number agreement. Broader impacts of the study on the following. On the Subanan community, this grammar description will be a valuable resource for Subanan teachers in the creation of instructional materials for Subanan language learners. On the Philippine linguistics, this dissertation is the first description of a Philippine language to be accompanied by an archive corpus of language data. Thus, it will not only provide important new information about an endangered language, it will also serve as a model for future research. The un on typology, the uncovering of the Subanan alignment system and, and its other distinctive features will, will inform language typologies as to how this language works. These are some of my references, and I would like to say thank you to the following. The Subanan in Malaya, Lintangan, Shokon, Baligyan, Ipil, and Artilim who gave me data unselfishly, and I specified their names there. And I would like to specifically mention William C. Hall, who is joining us now, all the way from the Philippines in Zamboanga, on Zamboanga Peninsula for helping me collect data and proofread every chapter of this dissertation. And I would like to say thank you to the following. My dissertation committee chair, Dr. Gary Halton, for his untiring mentoring and supervision for my entire fieldwork, analysis, and, rate, and writing my dissertation. My dissertation committee members, Dr. William O'Grady. William, I know that you're listening right now. I would like to say thank you for your invaluable help in analyzing the Subanon morphosyntactic phenomena, to Dr. Robert Plus for his very useful feedback on the phonology chapter, Dr. Bradley McDonald for his very relevant suggestions on the various chapters, and Dr. Patricia Abinales for constantly cautioning me to be careful, Sharon, during my series of fieldwork in Zamboanga. And thank you for my following awards. 
the NSF Doctoral Dissertation Research Improvement Grant, the Eastwood Center Travel Research Grant, the Belinda A. Aquino Philippine Studies Award, and the 2020 LLL Excellence in Doctoral Dissertation Research Award. And I have one coming in May, the 2020 Founder Region Fellowship Award with Seroptimist International in California, USA. Salamat sa kapanginong you. Thank you everyone for listening to my presentation. You can now ask me questions. Okay, thank you for your presentation, Sharon. That was very interesting. Um, thank you. You Jim. have, you have uh, if you go to the question and answer session, uh, section, you already have one question. Uh, for those of you in the audience, if you have questions for Sharon, please post them in Q&A. Okay, so Jim, um, while I am reading the question, can I, okay, answer live. Okay, I'm going, okay, lots of questions. Okay, I'm going to read a question. The first question is, hold on, oh. answer, okay, answer live, okay. From Tomas, okay. For the adjectives that are more root or om root, can those, take, can those same roots be used as verbs? What is the difference between the more root word that are adjectives and those that are adjectival verbs? Oh, interesting question. Are they homophones that are disambiguated in context? Okay, thank you, Thomas, for asking this one. So yeah, if you will learn Subanon, you will be you will be perplexed, but you will no longer be perplexed with my analysis. Okay, first, there's there's one more that has so many functions in the language. One of one functions of more is they mark adjectives. So more for adjectives, they won't inflect time. So it's always small. And then um, there, are, there is also more for patient voice um, in the language. If you want, I will show you some examples after this talk. So there is more is also um, uh, is used as a voice marker in, in, on verbs. And then it is also, as you, I have already discussed or shown, you, there's, we also use momi in the um, adjectival verbs, but they become, the mo becomes me in the, the realis. Okay, done. Next. So, okay, my, oh, I think this is the hardest question, Jim. Okay, somebody asked, as a project, I think you should, okay, this is William or great, Dr. William or greatest question. Okay, as a project, I think you should identify the signature features of Subana that make it distinct from the neighboring languages of Cebuano and Chabacano. William, um, I don't, is, okay. I will answer it live. So that's William's, I don't know if that is a question, but I think it's a suggestion. So um, yeah, I would, hold on Jim, why are the questions jumping? Uh, they're, they're jumping because people are upvoting them. But if you look, uh, William's question is the third on the list, so. Uh, yeah, it is not a question, but it's a suggestion, which is a very, very good suggestion. Yeah, um, thank you for suggesting this, William. It's really um, worth um, investigating. Yes, yeah, signature features of Subana that makes it different, that make it different or distinct from neighboring languages like Cebuano and Chabacano. Yeah, it will be interesting. And I also speak those languages. So um, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult research for me. And I will mark this as done. Okay, um, I want to answer this question. It sounds like Subana is only recently being used in writing. Could you give examples of this and how folks are learning and reading and writing? Oh, thank you, Candy, for asking this question. So, um, Subanon, uh, because um, Subanon is not really known in the entire world, but we started writing, I think, in 1980s when the literacy was introduced to the Subanon people. We started really writing. There were like literacy students who started to write in Subanon. However, they are not, the progress was not really that fast, and only few um, 
took their time to learn how to write in our language because and it's only women women girls who who do the lit, who attended the literacy so they were able to learn somehow um how we write in our language but then we have in 2012 we started teaching the language in malayalintangan area beginning in preschool so kids um are they have the opportunity to be educated in our language like teaching them our alphabet even if our alphabet or our writing system wasn't um wasn't standardized yet at that time so um they had to learn the alphabet and counting and writing and simple reading and writing so beginning in preschool to third grade that's um as far as i know that's the only levels in um in my place where we we introduced subanon as a separate class so they were taught how to learn how to how to read and write in subanon Did I answer that question, Jim, already? Uh, yes, you okay. did. You just have to click done. Done. Okay. Another question. Oh, wait, Gary. Oh, wait. I'm going to read the question of my dissertation chair. Your dissertation covers a wide range of topics. Obviously, you already knew a lot about Subhanan before you, begin, you began this research, but what is the most interesting or surprising new thing you learned during your research? Gary, thank you for asking this question. I would answer this live. Okay. Yeah, um, of course, as a native speaker of the language, I learned Subhanan. I, I knew a lot about Subhanan, but I did not learn how to write in Subhanan until I became a teacher. So when I started to analyze the grammar of Subhanan, what surprised me is the fact that verbal affixes are so hard to, to analyze. I spent two years, literally, thinking about how I should categorize Subhanan affixes, I mean, verbal affixes in the language. And I didn't know that um, Mo has several functions in the language, just one, one, one um, discovery that I have. Another is that I did not know that we have this adjectival verb until um, William, I mean, when I took William's class, um, Linguistics 422, that there is such a thing as for as ling, um, adjectival verb. So um, with that, I was able to apply those theories that I've learned from, the, from my syntax class um, and analyze the grammar of my language. But really, um, Gary, I'm so surprised that it's so hard to, I thought I knew my language, but when it comes to analyzing the verbal affixes, my goodness, I had a real, I had a hard time. I hope I answered that question. Are there other questions? Uh, yes, if uh, we still have time, we still have seven minutes. If anyone has any further questions, please post them in Q and A. Yeah, I know that my students are listening right now and they are welcome to ask questions. I hope they know how to do it. And also um, the other people in this room, I hope if you, can, if you have questions, please um, ask me. You may have answered everything that they wanted to know. Okay, um, I, if they don't have questions, this is what I can um, tell. Um, can they see me or can I, can I see them? Oh, I don't, yeah, this yeah. Is, if they don't have question, I have something for students who, are, who will be writing their dissertation. Writing a dissertation is not easy, but I found it, I found that Following the advice of your dissertation chair is, um, it helps a lot to follow the advice of your dissertation chair and your committee members. And don't be afraid, even if you make mistakes, you can, you can still improve your writing. And one advice, don't argue with your committee members. Don't argue with your dissertation chair because you will never be successful with your <laughs> dissertation. That's my advice. 
it takes a lot of patience, determination, and commitment to do a dissertation. If they don't have any question, again, I would like to say, salamat sa kapanginong of you. Thank you everyone for listening to my presentation and feel free to email me if you have further questions.